Hi and welcome to Outline of Pathology. This is the third episode in the series on fluid and hemodynamic disorders. In the first two episodes, we discussed edema and hyperemia and congestion. And in this third episode, we will be discussing shock. Shock is defined as a life-threatening clinical syndrome of cardiovascular collapse characterized by acute reduction of effective circulating blood volume that is hypotension and inadequate perfusion of cells and tissues that is hypoperfusion. So shock is a life-threatening clinical syndrome of cardiovascular collapse characterized by two things. One, acute reduction of effective circulating blood volume and two, inadequate perfusion of cells and tissues. The shock, one which we are going to discuss today is called true or secondary shock. That is the one in which there is circulatory imbalance between oxygen demand and supply. That is what we are going to discuss today. But there is another thing that is initial or primary shock which is a transient and benign vasovagal attack in which there is sudden reduction of venous return to the heart due to neurogenic vasodilation and peripheral pooling of blood. This occurs immediately after trauma or in certain conditions like emotional overreaction which you might have come across. Sometimes some people faint when there is a sudden emotional reaction like uh, due to fear, sorrow or grief. You must have come across such things as yes? and this is initial or primary shock and this is due to sudden vasodilation and peripheral pooling of blood due to neurogenic stimulus due to that emotional outburst which results in consequent reduction in cardiac input when there is a reduced cardiac input the cardiac output is also reduced and this leads to hypotension and hypoperfusion this is initial or primary shock but this is transient and benign that is it only extends for about a few seconds to a minute there is brief unconsciousness weakness sinking sensation pale and clammy limbs weak and rapid pulse and low blood pressure but all this for only a few seconds to minutes the victim faints and falls down and as soon as he falls down and lies flat uh, the gravity comes into action and uh, the circulation is restored to vital organs there is also another kind of shock called anaphylactic shock which is also not our topic today. Anaphylactic shock is immunologic in origin. We will see that some other time along with uh, the topic of immunology. Our topic today will be pertaining only to true or secondary shock which is true imbalance between oxygen demand and supply. Coming to classification and etiology of shock, etiology wise shock is classified into three major categories and a few other minor types. The three major types of shock are hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock and septic shock. Along with this there are a few minor types like traumatic shock, neurogenic shock, hypoadrenal shock also. Hypovolemic shock as the name itself suggests is due to inadequate circulatory blood volume. The inadequacy may be due to loss of blood due to acute hemorrhage, dehydration, burns, etc. So there is inadequacy in the circulatory blood volume and if this inadequacy is less than 1000 ml then it is compensated. If the blood loss is from 1000 to 1500 ml then it leads to mild shock. If it is from 1500 to 2000 ml then it will lead to moderate shock and if the blood loss or inadequacy is greater than 2000 ml then that will lead to severe shock. The clinical signs of hypovolemic shock include increased heart rate that is tachycardia, low blood pressure that is hypertension, low urinary output that is oliguria or anuria and there is alteration in the mental state as the patient may be agitated to confused or lethargic. Coming to cardiogenic shock, 
it is due to sudden fall in cardiac output so in hypovolemic shock there is inadequacy in circulating blood volume but here in cardiogenic shock there is sudden fall in cardiac output so here there is enough blood to circulate but the pump which circulates the blood is problematic the sudden fall in cardiac output can be due to deficient empty that is the blood reaches the heart but it is not pumped out from it for example myocardial infarction or mi or it can be due to deficient filling that is the heart is not completely filled as is the case in cardiac tamponade from hemopericardium hemopericardium is a condition like pericardial effusion where blood fills the pericardial sac and uh, the pressure of this blood in the pericardial sac compresses the heart leading to cardiac tamponade and this can lead to deficient filling of the heart or our cardiogenic shock can also be due to obstruction to outflow the heart here pumps normally but the outflow is obstructed as in the case in pulmonary embolism or tension pneumothorax etc the third type of shock is septic shock the cause of this is slightly different from uh, the other two types we just now saw here the shock is due to severe bacterial infection or septicemia the more common one is the gram negative septicemia but it can be gram positive septicemia also here the pathogenesis is slightly different from the other types as i mentioned here the cause is bacterial infection and the lysis of this infecting bacteria releases endotoxin which is a lipopolysaccharide this lipopolysaccharide endotoxin enters the circulation and binds with the lipopolysaccharide binding protein this lps lbp complex that is lipopolysaccharide lipopolysaccharide binding protein complex attaches itself to the cd14 molecule present on the surface of monocytes and macrophages this stimulates them to elaborate pro-inflammatory cytokines like tnf alpha il1 etc these pro-inflammatory cytokines by altering the endothelial cell adhesiveness and promoting nitric oxide synthesis causes vasodilation and consequent peripheral pooling of blood this widespread vasodilation and consequent pooling of blood can also be caused by activation of other inflammatory responses like uh, complement system the activation of muscles the activation of coagulation cascade the activation of kinin system etc and these systems are also activated by bacterial infection anyways the end result of all this that is vasodilation and peripheral pooling of blood causes a reduction in a return to the heart that is a reduction in venous return to the heart consequent reduction in cardiac output and consequent hypertension and hypoperfusion leading to our condition that is septic shock apart from these three major types that is hypovolemic shock cardiogenic shock and septic shock there can be other minor types also like traumatic shock in traumatic shock initially the shock is due to hypovolemia that is loss of blood due to hemorrhage but sometimes even after hemorrhage is controlled the patients continue to suffer loss of plasma volume into the interstitium of the injured tissue leading to continuation of shock that's why this is described as a separate type the other minor type is neurogenic shock which results from causes like interruption of sympathetic vasomotor supply another minor type is hypoadrenal shock in which there is adrenal insufficiency that is the flight or fight hormones secreted by the adrenal glands are insufficient and so the patient fails to respond normally to stresses like trauma illness etc and shock results during those stresses okay that's about etiology and classification of shock now coming to pathogenesis all forms of shock presents with three common derangements Number one, there is a reduced effective circulating blood. Number two, there is consequent reduced supply of oxygen. 
and number three there is also inflammatory mediators from shock induced cell injury that is hypoxic cell injury okay now this reduced effective circulating blood volume as we saw can be due to actual loss of blood as in hemorrhage or hypovolemic shock or it may be due to decreased cardiac output as in cardiogenic shock and this reduced effective circulating blood results in impaired tissue oxygenation this impaired tissue oxygenation finally results in hypoxic or anoxic cell injury this cell injury activates the innate immunity system of the body which produces inflammatory mediators but these mediators themselves become cause of cell injury eventually this inflammatory mediators can also be released due to endotoxins in the bacterial wall as we saw in septic shock now coming to stages of shock or pathophysiology of shock shock or progression of shock is historically divided into three stages compensated non-progressive initial or reversible shock progressive decompensated shock irreversible decompensated shock in the first or early stage that is compensated non-progressive initial or reversible shock an attempt is made by the body to maintain adequate blood supply to the vital organs the vital organs here are the brain and heart the body attempts to maintain adequate cerebral and coronary blood supply by redistribution of blood it redistributes the blood from not so vital organs to the vital organs just like we do when we are hard pressed for funds when we are deficient on funds what we do is we will reduce our luxury expenditure and only spend on our essential expenditure yes the same way because there is a reduction in blood volume or cardiac output because there is scarcity of resource what the body does is it redistributes the blood from not so vital or not so important functions to the most vital parts that is brain and heart this is achieved by three mechanisms one is widespread vasoconstriction hypertension and hyperperfusion activates neural and humoral mechanisms that is baroreceptors and chemoreceptors these mechanisms bring about widespread vasoconstriction especially in the vessels leading to skin and abdominal viscera thereby directing the blood to vital organs clinically this cutaneous vasoconstriction is presented as cool and pale skin second mechanism of compensation is fluid conservation by the kidney in order to compensate the loss of fluid the normal excretion of fluid through the kidneys is reduced this is achieved by activation of various mechanisms like a renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism adh mechanism etc we saw in detail about these mechanisms in our previous video on edema the third compensatory mechanism is stimulation of adrenal medulla in response to shock the adrenal medulla is stimulated to release catecholamines that is our flight and fight hormones that is epinephrine and norepinephrine these hormones increase the heart rate and try to increase the cardiac output so in the initial stages through all these mechanisms the body tries to compensate the shock if the condition which caused the shock is adequately treated at this stage the compensatory mechanisms which we discussed now may be able to bring the recovery of the patient and re-establish the normal circulation but this does not happen when the patient already suffers from some other stress or risk factor like pre-existing cardiovascular disease or lung disease just like our present day celebrity the covid 19 even our covid 19 becomes aggressive and turns into a killer mostly when the patient suffers from some other pre-existing disease yes 
same way when the patient here suffers from some other stress or risk factor the stage progresses into the next called progressive decompensated shock in this stage two things happen pulmonary hypoperfusion and tissue ischemia pulmonary hypoperfusion leads to tachypnea that is a rapid breathing just like tachycardia which is increased heart rate tachypnea is a rapid breathing so our pulmonary hypoperfusion leads to tachypnea that is a rapid breathing and adult respiratory distress syndrome that is ARDS tissue ischemia causes the tissues to switch to anaerobic glycolysis from normal aerobic glycolysis and this anaerobic glycolysis which we have already seen in our cell injury topic and which you must have already read in biochemistry also the anaerobic glycolysis process the byproduct is lactic acid okay. so this anaerobic glycolysis leads to metabolic lactic acidosis or accumulation of this lactic acid which lowers the ph of the tissue thereby making the vasomotor response ineffective the vasomotor response or vasoconstriction will not happen and this will lead to widespread vasodilation and peripheral pooling of blood clinically at this stage the patient shows confusion and worsening of renal function and this may lead to irreversible decompensated shock irreversible decompensated shock is when the shock is so severe that in spite of the set compensatory mechanisms and despite professional therapy that is in spite of the compensatory mechanisms instituted by the body itself and despite therapy and control of etiologic agent done by the medical professional no recovery takes place irreversible decompensated shock is a stage where in spite of compensatory mechanisms and despite therapy the condition of the patient worsens the features in this stage are number one progressive vasodilation at this stage due to hypoxic damage to the vessel walls the vessels become unresponsive to vasoconstrictors leading to vasodilation and peripheral pooling of blood this anoxic damage to tissues also releases pro-inflammatory mediators which also increases the vascular permeability this increased vascular permeability results in escape of fluid from circulation into the interstitial tissues which deteriorates the already reduced effective circulating blood volume this also releases myocardial depressant factor which causes coronary insufficiency and myocardial ischemia there is also worsened pulmonary hyperperfusion leading to pulmonary edema and ARDS that is adult respiratory distress syndrome there is also anoxic damage to heart kidney and brain the tissue damage in shock also activates the coagulation cascade leading to hypercoagulability of blood this leads to vascular thrombosis and microthrombi which impair the flow of blood further clinically at this stage the patient presents with coma worsened heart function and progressive renal failure now coming to morphologic features of different organs suffering from shock let's start with brain the condition is called hypoxic encephalopathy here the hypoxic encephalopathy affects the areas supplied by the most distal branches of cerebral arteries because they are farthest from the blood supply this is usually the border zone between anterior and middle cerebral arteries microscopically the feature seen is ischemic necrosis and this dead and dying nerve cells are replaced later by gliosis coming to heart in shock what we see in heart are small and large areas of hemorrhages and necrosis and sonal lesions which are nothing but opaque 
transverse contraction bands in myocytes near the intercalated disc. Coming to lungs, lungs usually are not much affected in hypovolemic shock because of their dual blood supply. But this does not apply to the septic shock because there the mechanism is different. In lungs, we see congestion, interstitial and alveolar edema, thickening and fibrosis of alveolar septa, etc. Coming to kidneys, in kidneys, we see tubular lesions at all levels. And this is referred to as acute tubular necrosis. If extensive muscle injury or intravascular hemolysis is associated with shock, then we can also see brown tubular casts. Casts are nothing but microscopic structures seen in the shape of tubules in the urine and these are mostly made up of proteins. We will discuss about these casts separately when we discuss systemic pathology of kidneys. For the time being, just remember kidneys in shock can present with tubular casts also. Coming to adrenals, they show acute hemorrhagic necrosis. Coming to GAT, the condition is called hemorrhagic gastroenteropathy. Here, due to hyperperfusion, there is mucosal and mural infarction. Here, hemorrhagic necrosis is seen in mucosa and sometimes submucosa. This must be distinguished from the necrosis occurring in occlusive ischemic injury of the bowel, that is, the ischemic injury which occurs when the blood supply to the bowel is occluded. In occlusive ischemic injury, the necrosis affects the deeper layers of the gut also, that is muscularis and serosa. Whereas here in hemorrhagic gastroenteropathy, the necrosis is limited to mucosa or submucosa. Liver in shock presents with nudmuck appearance. This nudmuck appearance as we saw in our last video is also seen in CBC liver. Okay. So, liver in shock presents with nutmeg appearance and the changes seen are hydropic change, focal necrosis, fatty change, etc. Coming to clinical features, it is characterized by depression of four vital processes. One, depression of BP, that is very low blood pressure. Two, subnormal or depressed temperature. Three, feeble and irregular pulse for shallow and sighing respiration. So the clinical features is characterized by depression of four vital processes, very low BP, subnormal temperature, feeble and irregular pulse, shallow and sighing respiration. BP, temperature, pulse and respiration are depressed. Along with this, the patient also presents with pale face, sunken eyes, weakness, cold, clammy skin. Coming to complications of shock, it includes ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, DIC, Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation, ARF, Acute Renal Failure, and MOTS, Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome. The progress of this condition leads to, of course, stupor, coma, and peace, that is death. Okay, with this, let us also declare peace for the time being. End of part 3. In part 4, we will discuss some other disorder, thrombosis. As usual, PDF notes are available for download in the description. You can mail me for further guidance and keep the channel subscribed for more videos. Until we meet in another video, thanks for watching. Bye.